my new year resolution for 2012 was to get in shape again. After my first kid was born I had lost my athletic interest but I had every intention of getting it back. So I started running four days a week with my friend Hannah who was a great runner and motivator. We would run after work 5 to 10 miles usually favoring the forest trail. It's the kind of trail that gets lighting in the darker months of the year so you can run there anytime really. Once you turn on the lights of the trail, you have 45 minutes to run the shorter trails and longer to run the longer ones. Then the lights shut off automatically. We had been running for about two months when we started seeing the same man hanging around the parking lot every time we got there. Thin man, 25 to 30 years of age, always dressed in sports clothes, but never actually running. He never looked you in the eye either. We speculated that he could be homeless camping nearby because he was constantly there. We got used to seeing him sitting somewhere close by, silently and always on his own. We felt sorry for him. He never seemed to talk to anyone or interact at all, but there was something about him that made us hesitate to talk to him or ask if he was okay. Can't pinpoint what it was, but something wasn't completely right with him. One evening Hannah didn't make it to our run and I decided to go on my own. I arrived at the parking lot, my car being the only car there. I did some stretching, turned on the lights, and set off on the 5 km trail. I hadn't seen the thin silent man when I started my run, perhaps it was getting too cold to sit there now that it was autumn, dark, and getting closer to the freezing point. He must have been there though, somewhere in the shadows, because when I got to the top of the first steep hill, I could hear heavy breathing somewhere behind me. I look over my shoulder and I see him. He is running like a man obsessed. In regular shoes, not running shoes, with his arms moving in a really strange, stiff manner as if he was made of metal, his hands like arrows were straight and in an upward angle. Sort off like a sprinter but more extreme, moving like a robot. For the first time he looked me straight in the eyes and it was the eyes of a predatory animal and it made my heart freeze. He had never done anything to harm me or anyone else as far as I knew, but the look in his eyes alone was enough to let me know that I was facing a serious, serious threat. I started running faster, trying to create distance between us and I could hear his heavy breathing getting even more strained. I ran like my life depended on it adrenaline pumping through my body and giving me new strength. I tore off my necklace and threw it on the ground thinking I must leave a trace if he takes me, something must be left behind. I tried screaming, hoping someone would be close enough to hear me, but I couldn't scream my lungs out and keep up the phase at the same time. Why is he doing this? What does he want? Who is he? I thought as I started to feel my lungs burn. Then I thought of my 15-month-old daughter and ran until I could taste blood in my mouth. He was still behind me, maybe 100 meters behind now, but I figured that if I trip and fall, or run out of energy, or fumble with the car keys once I reach the parking lot, then I'm screwed. So once I reached the sharp turn on the trail, I went off the trail and ran straight into the dark woods. I ran only a short distance and then I laid down flat on my stomach, my hand searching for a rock to defend myself with if he found me. I realized that I was wearing bright running clothes with reflexes and neon coloring. I had never felt so visible in the dark before. I could hear him reach the turn and thank God keep on running. I started to slowly and as silently as possible move further into the darkness. My heart sank again as I soon heard rapid footsteps closing in from the trail. He had realized that I must have gone off the trail once he saw that there was no sign of me ahead. He stopped, and I stopped. I could imagine him listening for any sound, and I held my breath and begged to God I don't believe in to make him go away. After a while I heard him say something in a language I didn't recognize and walk off. I didn't move. I feared that he would wait for me by the car and realized that I had to get off the trail and onto the main road and stop someone. I couldn't go back to the parking lot. 
I started to make my way further into the woods, knowing that I would eventually end up on the last part of the long tail and close to the main road. The lights on the trail suddenly shut off. That made me calmer at first, the dark was a comfort and protection, but then, after only a few moments, it switched on again. This could mean that another person had just started their run, and soon I would have someone there to help me, that he was out looking for me, or getting ready to prey on another lonely runner. I decided against waiting to find out, and continued my way towards the main road. It was dark and I fell multiple times, my clothes getting wet from the damp vegetation and I started to get cold. After what felt like a lifetime, I could see the 10 mile trail ahead and knew I was close to the main road. Soon I could hear the traffic. Once I made it to the road, I must have looked like I had been in a terrible accident. Blood from several small cuts from the falling, my clothes dirty, and my face I assume was petrified. My bright runner's shirt soon attracted the attention of a passing car, my waving and desperate shouting made it stop. The driver, a 40-ish year old man with his two kids in the back seat, spent the next 10 minutes or so trying to make sense of what I tried to say between the sobbing and the crying. He asked if I wanted a lift back to the parking lot and I told him no, please take me home instead. At home, my husband insisted on going to the parking lot to retrieve the car and calling the police. And report what? I asked. No crime had been committed. I just knew that he was out to get me. My husband went back for the car. The driver's seat window was smashed and my phone was gone. So was the photo of my daughter that I had hanging from the mirror. I don't know what he was trying to do or why he chased me the way he did. But the look in his eyes, there was no doubt he had bad intentions. This happened when I was about 18 years old. I was big into running back then and lived in a town that was a suburb but had big swaths of farmland. It was smallish tomato and strawberry fields, not those huge never-ending wheat fields. But I digress. I preferred running on the dirt at the edges of these fields because it was a lot easier on my legs than running long distances on concrete or asphalt. I was usually training for half marathons, 13.1 miles for those who aren't insane enough to think running is fun. This particular day I was planning to run an easy 6 miles. I told my mom and she suggested I do a loop and meet them at the dog park about 3 miles from our house as my halfway point. This is pre-cell phone era, but being careful I took a walkie-talkie my dad always used and my mom took the other one. Now, the walkie-talkie had a range longer than the ones my brothers and I played around with when we were younger, but it definitely did not work three miles away, and I honestly had no idea what its exact range was. So, I take off on my run. I'm planning to go on the sidewalk for a little bit until I get to the fields. I think it was lettuce or something then, but short small plants. I'm running in the dirt with the road a few yards to my left. I have to run south and then turn right onto a slightly smaller, less traveled road to get to the dog park. As I'm running on the first dirt park my parents drive by and being dorks, they honk and wave and yell at me. I wave and then soon after make my turn onto the smaller road. On this road is me V-flat dirt, a small drainage ditch, and never ending a lettuce field, then a wall that is the backyard of some houses. I start noticing how quiet this street is and how few cars are passing me. Then I randomly start thinking to myself, if someone tried to do something I could run to those houses. No, they're so far away, I'd never make it. Then I hear a car. But this one doesn't pass me like all the others. I hear it slow down so that it is behind me, just out of my peripheral vision. My senses go super alert and I immediately realize what a dumbass I was to pick this route because I'm stuck out here with no one to help me and nowhere to hide. The car starts speeding up enough so that it's next to me and I glance over and see a man. Middle age, white, and dark hair. Totally normal looking, but I get a chill down my spine immediately. 
He sort of leans over into the passenger seat and says in a super sweet voice, Hi, where are you going? Do you need a ride? I am scared and I realize this is not good. Admittedly, nothing has happened yet and he could be totally innocently just wanting to chat, but my intuition is in overdrive telling me I'm not safe. I hop over the ditch thinking at least that will make it harder for his car to follow me if I need to take off across the field to try and make it to those houses in the distance. This pisses him off. He guns it and gets closer to the ditch and in front of where I am and then he says in a voice I can only describe as bone chillingly evil, says, you know, you shouldn't be out here all alone. Something horrible could happen to you out here and no one would ever know where to find you. He has put his car in park and is taking off his seatbelt when I remember the walkie-talkie. The piece of crap is all static because I'm too far away, so I immediately turn down the volume and say loudly, Hey Dad. Yeah, yeah, I see your car. I'm over here by this red Buick. Do you see me? There was no car coming from the direction my parents were, and when I had started talking there was no one behind us either but by the grace of the universe at that exact moment a car turned onto that road. The guy saw it, looked at me, and sped off so fast he left skid marks. I have never run faster in my life, and I was looking behind me every few seconds and thought he'd be waiting for me at every intersection I had to cross. I was shaking. I was so scared and relieved when I got to that goddamn dog park. I told my parents everything and my mom called the cops. They took a statement but said it would just help if something actually happened to someone else. The weird part was, I was having trouble getting my story out. I was so upset and before I gave a description of the car the cop asked was it a red Buick? He wouldn't tell us why, but that just added to my feeling that I had narrowly escaped something awful. For context, I am a short 14-year-old female. And two days ago, something very creepy and unnerving happened to me. I am on the cross-country team at my school, and our coach wants us to stay in shape during quarantine, so I was going on a run. I tend to run early in the morning, around 5.30 to 6 o'clock, because the weather is cooler and less people are out and about. It's also nice to get your run over with so that the rest of the day is free. For you to understand exactly what happened, I need to explain the route that I run, so bear with me. I live in a nicer neighborhood in the U.S. My neighborhood is also near a major road. When I go on my run, I leave my neighborhood, travel down the major road, and enter a different neighborhood that is close to my own. This neighborhood has a low crime rate, is on the richer side, and goes along a big reservoir. It has lots of hills, pretty foliage, and some of the bigger houses near the entrance of the neighborhood are backed up against some woods. I run through it because I like to look at the big houses, and sometimes some of the wildlife, such as deer, makes its way out of the woods. When I run through it early in the morning, I get to enjoy the lack of people and the birdsong. You need to understand that I run this route every morning, and no strange occurrences have happened with me being there. Now that you understand the setup, I'll tell you what happened. Like I said, this was two days ago. I left my house and neighborhood, per usual, and ran along the major road to the entrance of the neighborhood that I usually run in. Almost as soon as I come across the first house on the street, one of the ones that is backed up against some woods, I hear a rustling in the bushes. I thought, oh cool, it's probably one of the deer, and slowed down to try and spot it, but it never came out of the bushes. So I pick up my pace and continue along. Not long after that, maybe two minutes later, I hear someone on a bike behind me. This isn't unusual, so I don't think much about it until the guy on the bike says, beep beep. I'm like, okay, maybe he doesn't have a bell or something, so I move over to the right to let the guy pass me on my left. But he doesn't. He stays right behind me. I'm not a slow runner, but someone on a bike would definitely be faster than me. If you have ever tried to go really slow on a bike, you will understand how hard it is to keep your balance. So I'm thinking, okay, this is really weird. 
I have a feeling that this guy is bad news and that I need to shake him. So I slow to a stop and get over to the side of the road to tie my shoe and to see if he'll pass me. He doesn't. He just stops. When it becomes clear that he isn't going anywhere, I get back on the sidewalk and keep running. Bad choice, I know, but I was panicking. Of course, the man on the bike follows. But even though my attempt to shake him didn't work, I got a good look at him. He was tall and thin, with glasses, and he wore a Nirvana t-shirt. He definitely looked like a serial killer. As an avid reader of horror novels and an obsessive listener of scary podcasts, I was already thinking of the absolute worst possible outcome. I was going to be murdered when I had been out of my house for less than 10 minutes. Worse, I was over two miles from my house, so I was going to have to continue running. Now, I know that what I should have done was go to the closest house and let the family that lived in it know what was going on, but I wasn't thinking clearly. So I kept running, and the man on the bike kept following me at a meticulously slow pace. I was tired, sweaty, and near tears. I wanted to go home. Home was the only thing on my mind. I started looking around for ways to lose him or hide. Just up ahead of me was a sharp turn. My hope was that I could get around the turn faster than him, and then hide. Not a very well-developed plan, but better than being killed by a random person. I sprinted around the corner as fast as I could, right into a young woman who was out walking her two dogs. Big dogs, German shepherds, actually. I started to apologize profusely, trying to look calm. Apparently, I did not look calm at all, because she asked me what was wrong. The man was still behind me, practically breathing down my neck. I stared at the woman, pleading with my eyes, and said, How is your walk going, Mom? I prayed that she would understand, that she would play along, and fortunately for me, she did. She looked at me and said, Where were you? Me and your father were looking all over for you. We both then turned to look at the man on the bike, who looked extremely shocked. He turned around and quickly pedaled away, almost running into an oncoming car, actually. As soon as he was gone, I broke down crying, telling the woman everything. She was very sympathetic and kind, and she ended up calling my parents to come pick me up. I was still sobbing when they arrived, and I had to catch my breath before telling them what happened. Looking back, I am almost positive that if I hadn't run into that woman, that something awful would have happened. I'm not sure if the rustling in the bushes at the entrance of the neighborhood was the man on the bike or not, but I am completely content with never knowing. I have not been back to that neighborhood since, and I'm not sure if I ever will. So, to the creepy guy who followed me on his bike for an entire mile, let's not meet. So I have been a long time listener and I thought it was time to join in and share my personal creepiest encounter. Around 11 years ago when I was 18, I left school and moved to the big bright lights of London town to start my gap year and discover myself. I didn't know a lot of people and I was naive, young, and totally unstreetwise. One night I had a few drinks with one of my few friends and then I headed home hailed a black cab and gave the driver directions to a family friend's house I was staying in in Notting Hill. The black cab driver must have immediately sensed that I wasn't in a great mood, I could never be a poker player, you can read every expression on my face, and started asking me about myself and what I was doing in London. I had had a fair bit to drink, so I remember telling him that I was new to London and lonely, that the city was hard, typical stupid 18-year-old. We pulled into the residential street I was staying on, which was very quiet and dark. The cab driver pulled up a few doors from where I was staying and I suddenly didn't relish the idea of creeping into a dark house to just go to bed. I was 18 and full of energy, so when the cab driver asked if I wanted a drink I jumped at the chance. The cab driver turned off the engine of the car and the street was suddenly very quiet. He opened his car door, got out, opened mine, stepped in, pulled the seat down, and sat directly opposite me. At this point some alarm bells started ringing. 
This was such a strange and creepy violation that I was suddenly very aware of my surroundings. Having gone from talking to the back of someone's head with a partition between, to suddenly sitting face to face with that person with about 20 centimeters between our knees was a very odd scenario. But hey, I was 18, bored, and really wanted a drink. I may add that I went on to have a pretty serious alcohol addiction over the next few years, checked into rehab, and am now sober, but this is a very good example of the kinds of dangerous situations I put myself in to obtain a drink. The memory from then onwards is hazy, but Steve, which is what we are going to call the cab driver, had some homemade champagne that we sat and drank for a few hours. He was nice to begin with, and even though I knew this was a weird situation, wanting a drink was a more powerful emotion than my safety. But as I got drunker, I do remember the conversation becoming more and more uncomfortable. I was very aware that I was stuck in a confined space with a strange man and that he knew where I lived. Even my stupid 18-year-old self knew that I could be in trouble if I wasn't careful and culminated in him saying that he was a virgin and that he knew I was the one and that his first time should be with me. At some point during the conversation I'd said I was struggling for money, so then he offered me 200 pounds to have sex with him. I felt extremely sick and violated and needed to get out of there. Steve was not pleased and wanted me to stay, verging on the aggressive, insisting that I take his number if I changed my mind. The next morning I woke with a horrendous hangover and a terrible sense of guilt. I burnt the piece of paper Steve had given me and swore to never put myself in such a compromising position again. For months I was wary of black cab drivers outside my house and I never told anyone what had happened. I was sick with shame. Fast forward six years, I was working as a junior at a woman's magazine in the center of London. On my way into work I grabbed my usual copy of the Metro newspaper, take a sip of my coffee, glance at the front page, and freeze. There staring back at me is a mugshot of Steve and the headline Black Cab Rapist. The face in my memory was now on the front page of every paper in the land, and they were calling him one of the most prolific sex offenders in British criminal history. When I got to work I called the police and that afternoon I went to the police station to give my statement. It was the first time I had told anyone about that night, and whilst there was a huge sense of relief there was also so much guilt that I hadn't reported him sooner. Despite the fact that he had not touched me, the police think that I may have been one of the first victims he tried to ply with spiked champagne, but that he had not put enough drugs in it to work. Steve's real name is John Warboys and is now serving eight years for attacking, drugging and raping over 100 women on the streets of London. I was never called as a witness due to the fact that he had not touched or drugged me, but many brave women were and they faced him in court. John, you disgusting human being, let's not meet again. I am in London, UK. We are in a tier 4 lockdown which means stay in your home, only go out for one shopping trip or exercise, no mixing with people outside of your own home or support bubble etc. With a mutating strain of COVID-19 rampaging through London, hospital beds nearly at capacity and death toll rising it made sense to stay indoors as much as possible. But every human being has a breaking point and mine was eight days of wandering around my one bedroom apartment. I had talked myself out of Zoom and ran out of conversations to talk to myself about. At 10 p.m. New Year's Eve, I decided to get some air and go for a quick walk around the perimeter around the local park, all on the main road, which takes about 40 minutes. The plan was to stop at a local grocery store and pick up a bottle of red wine on the way back. I stepped out of my apartment with a mask firmly affixed and started walking. One thing that I was not prepared for was the eerily empty and almost silent streets. As it was just below freezing I decided to hustle and cut through some side streets first. In hindsight this was a big mistake. Navigating myself through very quiet side streets, I neared the park when I saw a van, a Mercedes Sprinter size, turn in and rapidly approach me. Deciding to let them pass before crossing I came to a halt. The van began to slow as it approached me. 
I could see the cab was occupied by two men, between the ages of 25 and 40 years old. Then the van stopped, the window rolled down, and one man leaned out and said, Hey friend, we are lost. Can you tell me the way to the station? The accent was not from the UK, and I am not going to state its origin as I am not going to get into stereotypes. Alarm bells began to ring out immediately. What was a van doing out at this time and why directions to the local train station? In the middle of a tier 4 lockdown, the van had stopped so the side door was facing me. I stepped back a few paces and gave directions very quickly. I did not understand everything. I think best if you show us. With that he opens his door and the side door to the van opens to reveal another two men sitting in the back. I just turned and ran down the side street that I had emerged from. They then hop out the van and chase after me. Knowing that these guys were fitter and younger than I, a foot race to my apartment building was out of the question. The only advantage I had was a head start and local knowledge of the streets. The side street leads into a larger street that has homes all with large hedges. I ran past a few homes and entered the front garden of a house that had the most imposing and opaque hedge. It was unlit. I dug down. Lucky for me that house did not have a motion sensor light. Within a few seconds I could hear footsteps. They went past me and stopped. I peeked through the hedge vegetation to see the man who had asked for directions. He was a few houses down from me and on the opposite side of the street. He was looking around. Then the sound of the vehicle. I thought oh no the van. But lucky for me it was a car. The man looked at his phone then looked around pretending he was checking something and eventually walked away. Leaving the residential street as quickly as possible. The car continued its way. I waited for another 10 minutes. Sitting behind the hedge in the front garden, practicing an explanation if the house lights came on. The house stayed unlit. And after my allotted time I rose and quickly walked back to my apartment building, keeping to shadows and reacting to every sound. I made it back and bolted the front door. Only when I sat down did I understand what I had just avoided. All this for some air and a bottle of red wine? I poured myself a black coffee and debated calling the police, but what would I say? Had anything really happened that they could act on? Intuition of being kidnapped or being in danger is not enough evidence. Plus being a man, this would not be a priority. Especially on a night that they would be overstretched on. I just waited on the new year realizing that I had a lucky escape and that I should stock up on red wine at a more decent time. I grew up in a rural part of northern England, but moved to London six years ago to live with my partner as she had got a job there. I didn't drive at the time, so I would take the bus to and from work and walk a short way back to our flat. The walk from the bus stop to home never took longer than 10 minutes and it was through a well-lit area, lined with shops and restaurants. Up until this incident, I never really had any issues. It was November, so it was pretty much dark by the time I left work at 6 p.m. One Friday night, after I had only been living in London for a couple of months, one of my work colleagues asked if I wanted to go for a drink with her after work. I'm not a big drinker. But it was a Friday night, my partner was working late, and since I was fairly new in town and desperate to make friends, I agreed to go along for a couple. I took the bus with her straight from work to a pub close to her home. She lived basically the next suburb over from me, so it was fairly close, but not an area I was particularly familiar with. I had two or three drinks so I was a little tipsy, but not drunk, not that it should matter. I decided to leave at around 10 p.m. so as not to be traveling home too late at night, particularly along a route I didn't know. I said my goodbyes and left my colleague and her friends at the pub. On my way out I stopped to put my empty glass down on the bar. As I did so, I looked down the bar and made brief eye contact with a man sitting a little further down. 
I gave a passing smile, as you might do when you make accidental eye contact with a stranger, and then continued on my way out of the pub. The bus stop was maybe 200 yards down and across the street from the pub, you could see it from the entrance. I was about halfway to the stop when I got that prickling feeling on the back of my neck, like you get when someone is staring at you through a window or across a busy street. I turned to look behind me quickly, and it didn't take me long to figure out what was giving me that feeling. It was the man I had glimpsed back at the pub, walking about 20 paces behind me, watching me carefully. I was a little weirded out, but I reasoned with myself that it was a Friday night in London. There were a lot of people on the street, people heading home, people on nights out, people just milling around. So I put it down as perfectly innocent and just kept walking, trying hard not to look back. I reached the stop and fortunately the bus was only a few minutes away. The man reached the stop only moments later and proceeded to hover a few feet away from me. I was on my phone and trying not to look at him, but I could feel his eyes on me. I looked up and caught him staring at me, expecting him to look away awkwardly as soon as he realized he had been caught looking, but he didn't, he just kept on staring. This was the first time I had got a proper look at him. He was a young man, couldn't have been much older than myself, I was in my early 20s at the time, quite slender and tall, with short shaved hair. He would have been good looking if not for the intensity of his staring. I must have been looking at him for longer than I thought because he then gave me a sly wink and I quickly looked away. It wasn't a nice kind of wink, the kind that might be considered cute or endearing. No, this was an unsmiling, almost threatening kind of wink. The kind that told me he was watching me, that he knew I knew that he was watching me, and that he didn't care. My bus eventually rolled up and I got on, quietly hoping that he wasn't getting the same bus as me. I wasn't so much afraid at this point, just uneasy. It isn't nice being intensely stared at by anyone, much less a complete stranger, but I was still under the assumption at this point that it was just some creepy dude who happened to be at the same bus stop as me, nothing more than that. I sat down on the lower deck, close to the driver, and my heart sank a little to see the man get on just behind me. Fortunately, there was already someone sat in the seat next to mine, so he had to sit across the aisle. But still he stared at me, now with a strange little smirk on his lips that made me feel even more uncomfortable. I did my best to pretend that I simply hadn't noticed him, only allowing myself the occasional glance up at him to see if he was still watching me. From what I could tell, he didn't look away once. With each passing minute, I was becoming more and more afraid, despite my best efforts to convince myself that this was all just an innocent misunderstanding on my part. At every stop I was praying for him to get off, for this to be his stop so I could relax and prove to myself I was just being paranoid. As the stops passed, I knew I was going to have to get off the bus soon, and I was fairly sure at this point that he was going to follow me. We were coming close to my usual stop when the bus took an unexpected turn onto a housing estate. I was so distracted by this guy staring at me and potentially following me, I had completely forgotten this was a different bus route to my usual one. In a normal situation this would not have bothered me. But in my current situation it was the absolute worst possible thing that could have happened. I was no longer on the well-lit street full of shops in an area I knew quite well. Now I was on a dark, quiet, completely unfamiliar estate. No people around, just rows of silent houses with the lights off. I realized I didn't actually know the route home from here either. I knew I had to be close, but having only lived in the area for a couple of months, I hadn't had the chance to get to grips with all the shortcuts yet. I waited until the very last minute to ring the bell for the next stop and I jumped off very quickly. It was a long shot, but I hoped that the weird guy would be caught off guard and not get the chance to follow me. Suffice to say, that plan didn't work. In hindsight, I should have just stayed on the bus until it reached the terminal and then maybe reported my concern to the driver. But at the time, I was a bit tipsy and scared and just wanted to go home. It was a dumb, spur-of-the-moment decision made out of panic. 
he hopped casually off the bus after me, and at this point there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that he was following me. I decided to stay at the bus stop and to call someone, anyone to come and help me. But all my friends and family that I would usually call in a bad situation lived back home, hundreds of miles away. My partner was working nights and wasn't even allowed to have her phone on her person. I tried calling the girl who I had been out to the pub with to see if I could maybe double back to hers and stay at her house for the night. She wasn't answering her phone. I could call the police? But what if it turned out he wasn't following me? What if he realized I had called the police and attacked me? All the time I was desperately trying to get in touch with someone who might be able to help me in my current predicament, this guy was leaning casually against the bus stop, hands in pockets, just watching me. Several minutes passed and I still had no better plan in mind than to just stay where I was. I certainly didn't want this guy knowing where I lived. These thoughts were all rushing through my mind at about a hundred miles per hour and I damn near crapped myself when suddenly, he said, what's your name? I could do nothing but stare at him in surprise for a second or two, then I forced myself to reply. Amy. I lied. I figured I didn't want to piss him off at all, so I just answered with whatever name came into my head first. That horrible little smirk slid across his lips again. He was still leaning against the stop. Give me your number, Amy. He said, and he took out his phone. Let's be friends. This didn't sound like a request. There was a sharpness to his voice which made me shudder. No, thank you, I replied. His face dropped, the smirk disappeared, then reappeared as he seemed to compose himself. Where do you live? I'll walk with you. He said, a little more assertively this time. I'm okay. I'm staying at a friend's. He's actually coming to get me right now to take me back to his place. I lied again, desperate to come up with anything that would make him go away. He paused for a while, and I could practically hear the cogs turning as he tried to figure out whether I was lying. He watched me silently for a long moment, studying my face with a cold calculation. He must have decided that I was lying to him because he suddenly took a step towards me, and through slightly gritted teeth, as if I was really trying his patience, he repeated, Give me your number. Startled at the sudden move towards me, I took several steps back. He continued to approach me. I panicked, turned, and tried to walk away from him, but he reached out and grabbed me by the wrist. I spun back round to face him, and now the only look on his face was one of complete anger. There is no need to be such a be about this. He hissed. Fear had surged through me when he grabbed my arm, and his touch seemed to burn my skin like an open flame. It was repulsive, so much so that my body had an almost convulsive reaction to being touched by him. I managed to twist my arm out of his grip and I heard a voice in the back of my mind telling me, you need to get away right now. Run. And I did run. I turned and ran as fast as my legs would carry me back the way the bus had brought me. I didn't even fully know where I was going, but I knew I had to get myself as far away from this person as possible. I made the mistake of looking over my shoulder once to see him now running after me, only a few feet behind. His eyes were wide and angry. The fear and adrenaline kept me going, longer and faster than I'd probably ever run before. Just as I reached the end of the road, I saw what I needed, and I instantly burst into tears of relief. Two police officers were walking towards me along the other side of the street. I made a beeline for them, now also yelling for help. By the time I reached them I was a sobbing, breathless mess. I could hardly speak to tell them what had happened. I managed to splutter a few choice words and turned to point towards my pursuer. By now he was almost back at the other end of the street. He had simply turned around and walked calmly back towards the bus stop like he was out for a nice evening stroll. I was worried the police officers were just going to think I was some crazy drunk girl. But they could see I was clearly very shaken and one of them ran off after the guy. The man had, by now, disappeared around the corner at the other end of the street, 
followed shortly after by the police officer, and that was the last I saw of him. The officer who went after the guy radioed his partner a few minutes later to say he had lost him once they reached the main street, but he would keep looking. The officer who had stayed with me took a description from me, and I made a report about what had happened. I told the officer I didn't fully know my way home from where I was, so she walked with me back to my front door. I was shaking the whole way. When I got into my room, I lay in bed crying until I fell asleep. I never heard anything else about it after that. There is no doubt in my mind that if he had caught me that night, he would have harmed me. I believe he was out looking for someone to target. I believe he clocked me the moment we made eye contact in the pub. If given the chance, he would have followed me all the way back to my front door in the hope that I would, at some point, be alone in a secluded enough area for him to grab me. Everything about his demeanor and the way he spoke to me just screamed that this was a man who was just predatory. And the way he was able to go from being furiously angry, enough to chase me down the street, to immediately regaining his composure and walking away like nothing had happened in order to evade being caught, is just absolutely terrifying. I'll remember his face for a very long time, and I would not be surprised if it comes up on the news at some point in the future. So, creepy stranger who thinks it is acceptable to do this kind of thing, let's not meet again. I'm pretty sure I was almost robbed tonight in my apartment complex. For the record, I'm a 21-year-old female, and I stand about 5 feet 2 inches. Not very threatening. In order to understand this story, you have to understand how my complex is set up. It's three buildings that form a U-shape with parking and access on the inside of the U. In the middle of the three buildings, there's a row of garages for storage. The whole parking lot works like a circle. You can drive around the garages to park in front of any building. Now to my story. My fiancé has been out of town for the past week with work, so I've had the pleasure of walking the dogs by myself every night. We live on the second floor, so every night I walk down three flights of steps to the basement so they have access to the yard. My windows face the parking lot and usually have the blinds at least halfway up. Anyone paying attention for a day would know I was alone. Tonight, I didn't feel like cooking, so I ordered dinner, walked the dogs, and then grabbed my keys to go pick it up. Before I left, I glanced outside the window and noticed a car parked parallel outside my building in front of the walkway. This wasn't super unusual because that's typically where people park waiting to pick someone up instead of pulling into a parking space. Still, I felt uneasy so I leashed my 50 pounds lab mix to go with me. I exit the building and an SUV pulls up behind the car. They both speed up and disappear around the garages. Now, my building is at the bottom of the U and my car is parked along the right side of the lot. I start walking over there when both cars come speeding back around the garages and slow behind my car. I immediately jump in and lock the doors. The SUV parks a few spots down from me on the right side of the U. The car parks on the other side of garages on the left side of U. As I pull out, I realize I left my wallet inside. No biggie, both vehicles are parked at this point. It was probably a misunderstanding. I decide to parallel park in front of my building, leave the car running, and go grab my wallet. I pull my car so that I'm parked in front of my building, facing the car that had parked in the left lot. Before I have a chance to get out, the car shoots out of its parking space and lines up head to head with me. I'm confused. The car is still advancing towards me. I begin to back my car up to avoid a collision. That is until I look in the rear view mirror and see the SUV has pulled up behind me. They both are driving closer to me, boxing me in and preventing my escape. I'm trapped in my car with no weapon. So I do the only thing I can think of cut my wheel to the right as hard as I can and throw the bitch into reverse. I reverse around the SUV and retreat to the far end of the parking lot. The SUV speeds out of the lot and the car parks in front of my building. At this point, I'm pissed and I'm hungry. My mind is set that I'm going to get my wallet and go pick up my food. I pull my car back up in front of my building, grab my dog, and sprint up the stairs taking two at a time. 
I lock the door behind me and quickly locate my wallet. A quick glance out the window tells me the car is still there with the SUV now parked beside it. I don't have a gun, so I grab the next best things, my taser, which I tucked into the band of my pants, and a hunting knife my fiancé had gotten for Christmas. I grab my dog and with keys in one hand and a knife in the other, I open my door. Immediately I hear footsteps on the other side of the hallway. I pick up the pace as a tall man in a hoodie rounds the corner and starts following me. My dog has her hair raised, she's growling and snarling. He continues to advance. At this point I've cleared both stairs and I'm jogging to my car. I can hear the man pick up speed behind me. I reach my car and spin around while flipping the knife up into view. The man immediately stops in his tracks and walks back towards the SUV. Both vehicles speed out of the lot and, with shaking hands, I begin my trip to go pick up my wings. So, drivers of the car and SUV that chased me around my parking lot? Let's not meet. This happened back while I was in college a couple years ago. Me and my roommate moved into a beautiful apartment our junior year of college. Our parents made it extremely clear that two small females living alone together was not ideal for some of the cheaper shady neighborhoods close to our college. We attended a college in our state capital, so we were in a city environment and had certain criteria we had to meet in order for us to live there and for them to co-sign our leases. Lit sidewalks, keyed entry into the apartment building, lit parking lot, X amount of blocks from campus, etc. So we finally found one that fit our parents' criteria. Our apartment building had a keyed entry for both the front of the building and the back gate that led to the fire escape. Our apartment was an end unit that led to the fire escape, so there were two deadbolt locks on it. We loved our apartment. We felt safe, we had fun, truly living this college experience. And then my roommate's boyfriend starts slowly moving his things into the apartment and staying there way more often than he should. I finally tell my roommate if he wants to stay here and use the water, electricity, and food I help pay for, then he needs to pay for it too, including our rent. I tell her a three-way split where I'm paying only my rent and he can pay the entire electric, water, and trash bill. I think I'm being pretty fair, and even though her boyfriend doesn't have a job, that's not my problem. I work and go to college. Your I don't want to work at McDonald's excuse is completely garbage. If you want a place to stay then to the Golden Arches you shall go, buddy. So instead, my roommate starts sneaking him in really late at night after I go to sleep, and he leaves on days I'm not home. While I'm in class, he's there, then leaves before I come back. My schedule is extremely routine. Well, he can't have a key. So, if my roommate is in class or at work, how is he getting in? He can't take my roommate's key because if he decides to leave halfway through the day, how will she get her key back? All good questions. The solution they come up with is to leave the back door unlocked that leads to the fire escape, and then he can just jump the fence at the bottom of the fire escape to get back on the fire escape when he's ready to come back or stick a rock in between the door. Whatever works for him. So I'm off of work and school one Thursday morning and I decide I'm going to sleep in as long as I possibly can. My roommate and her boyfriend have already left for the day, so naturally they leave the door unlocked. I'm asleep like a pretty princess, it's about 10 in the morning, when I hear the back door open to the apartment. I wake up just enough to recognize the noise, realize it's my roommate or her boyfriend, and I brush it off and go try to drift back off. All of a sudden I start hearing someone creep through the apartment. It definitely doesn't sound like casual walking. It is clearly someone stepping slowly and quietly through the apartment. My door to my room is ajar, just a sliver, but I don't see anything out the door, and I'm honestly too tired to get up and look. A couple minutes pass and I figure that my roommate and her boyfriend are just being weirdos and I fall back asleep. I can't be sure how much time passes before I open my eyes, but it can't be too long. I wake up to my door opening. My back is to the door and I am facing the opposing wall. I slowly start to turn over to see why my roommate or her boyfriend would dare wake me from my slumber and there he is. 
a burglar, in my room, next to the bed I'm currently laying in. A six-foot-tall, 250-pound burglar, unplugging my TV, about five feet from where I currently am. I immediately pretend I'm just shifting positions in my sleep and continue to roll over with my eyes as shut as I could make them seem, still open enough to watch what was going on. He hears me shuffling as I turn over, stops, looks dead at me, and luckily doesn't realize that my eyes are open just a tiny bit. He goes back to unplugging my TV, my DVD player, shoves it in a bag he's brought, steals my change jar, and casually starts walking out of the front door to my apartment. Like he came in for a cup of fucking tea or something. After I hear the door shut, I immediately spring out of bed, grab my phone, start dialing 911, all while locking the back and front doors. The dispatcher is trying to calm me down. At this point, I am hysterical. I can't even catch my breath to tell her okay. Luckily, I told her my address before I started hyperventilating. I will take a second to commend the police department, both city and college, because they were there in less than three minutes. She tells me the cops are there, but they need me to go downstairs to let them in the building because they don't have the key to the front door of the building. I am so afraid to open the door to my apartment and even look down the hallway. I'm about to walk to the front door and extend my arm out to the handle when I hear, ma'am ITS the police. As if I didn't get scared enough already. They yell through the door. I am paranoid because the dispatcher just told me they couldn't get in and didn't realize someone probably let them in downstairs. I ask the dispatcher to confirm that the people at my door are actually police officers. She tells me that they are at my door, okay cool. I open the front door and I collapse right there. My legs completely turn into jello and I just hit the floor. I blacked out for a brief period of time, but they helped me up and sat me down on the couch. There's at least 10 officers in my apartment from both the city and college departments. When I look outside the living room window to the street below, there are five or six cop cars blocking the street. I later found out they were doing a perimeter search around the immediate area. I'm being bombarded with questions now. I have to try to find out what's missing besides the stuff from my room. I'm crying, I'm shaking, this is not at all how I saw my day off going. I tell them my roommate left the back door open for her boyfriend, they inspect the back door, etc. The next thing I know my roommate and her boyfriend walk in and they both have the most dumbfounded looks on both of their faces. At this point, now there is a detective talking to me and I'm giving my statement, giving a description of the burglar, the stuff missing, looking at mugshots, etc. I immediately stop talking to the detective, look up at both of them and blurt out, someone robbed us while I was asleep, he came into my room. My roommate looks me dead in the face and says, oh my god is any of my stuff gone? That's really what she asked me right there. If your replaceable stuff is missing? Two officers take her and her boyfriend aside and talk to them while I'm finishing up with the detective. I called my then boyfriend and he came over to help me pack my stuff to stay over at his house for a couple of days, which turned into staying until my lease at my place ended around four months later. After failing to recognize any suspects in a lineup, the cops slowly start leaving. After they all leave, I call my parents to tell them what has happened, gather my things and head over to my boyfriend's house. My roommate and her boyfriend never once apologized. Not for leaving the door unlocked, but just a general, I'm sorry this happened to you type of apology. They never asked me if I was okay, if I wanted to talk or anything. The day my lease ended was the best day of that entire year. I couldn't wait to get away from my roommate, her boyfriend, and that apartment. They never found the guy who robbed me that day. I didn't even care about the materialistic things. He robbed me of my safety and security, and it took a good amount of counseling to get that back. I am also thankful he didn't try to attack me that morning. My friendship with my roommate was tarnished. I haven't spoken to her since. To this day I don't sleep with my back to the door and I always have a knife under my mattress. I am a female and this story happened when I had just turned 20. This was my very first apartment and I was so excited to be in it. 
My freshman year, I had lived in a dorm on campus, and before that I just lived with my mom, so I had never lived on my own before. The apartment was a two-bed, two-bathroom, and I shared it with my friend who I had known since we were 13. Josh was my absolute best friend, and it was his first year at the university, so naturally I was like, oh my gosh, I'll show you around. We did everything together, pretty much. Fast forward to the homecoming football game. We attend a university that's crazy into football, and we're actually a pretty good team, so the homecoming game is a big deal to everyone. Josh was so excited to go out because it was his first homecoming game. He was going to go with this boy he started flirting with, and he wanted me to come along. I don't really remember why I didn't want to go, but I just didn't. Josh got mad at me, we said dumb stuff to each other, and he left. So I was alone for the rest of the night. I had a small dog named Poppy, who lived with us. She was around a year old at the time. We actually had a pretty relaxing night in the beginning. I took a shower and put on face masks and Poppy and I and watched TV in bed and stuff. I remember listening to a song on repeat the entire day because that's what I do when I find a new song that I like. To this day, I still can't listen to the song without being reminded. I went to sleep around 10 p.m., I think. I wasn't keeping up with what was going on with the football game, so I really have no idea if it was just ending or whatever. But I knew not to expect Josh home early because he was going out with the guy he was seeing, Dylan, afterwards. There is a strip of bars along one of the main roads running towards campus, and that's where they would be. That's where everyone would be after the game ended. I don't know what time it was, but I woke to cabinets being slammed and really loud noises. It was really dark in my room, and the only thing I could see was that the kitchen lights were on. I saw the light coming through the bottom of the door. It sounded like people were going through our kitchen cabinets one by one. Poppy was at the edge of the bed barking like a crazy dog. I had never seen her act this way. I was struggling to keep myself awake because I'm a really heavy sleeper and I just knew it wasn't Josh and Dylan, but some stupid part of me decided to call out hello, but it was weak sounding and I really don't know if they heard me or not. Suddenly my bedroom door opened. I shot up. Poppy was snarling and trying to lunge at the stranger in my freaking bedroom. I couldn't see anything because the light from the open door was kind of blinding, I just saw his figure. He was wearing a hoodie and he stood there for maybe 15 seconds and I was just staring at him. The whole time Poppy was trying to fuck him up. He quickly closed my door and I don't know why I didn't just move. I wanted to move but I couldn't. Then my door flings open a second time and we're staring face to face again for the same painfully long amount of time. My heart was racing and I remember thinking he is going to hurt me. Now that I look back, I should have screamed or something. Poppy was at the very edge of the bed now, vicious and snarling. She sounded like a big dog honestly. And then he slammed my door shut. As soon as he did I jumped out of bed and locked my door. I heard them take my car keys. I was terrified they would find my car and steal it since I had just parked directly outside. I frantically called 911 and was sobbing the whole time. I said someone is in my house, they came in my room please help and it took them 30 minutes to get there. When I know that there have been cop cars everywhere surrounding the football game since it was homecoming. When I finally came out, the living room and my roommate's bedroom were completely ransacked. My roommate's TV was on the floor because they tried to carry it out, but I guess decided to just leave it. They stole my Xbox and all my games. They stole my freaking book bag with my textbooks and my homework in it. The two policemen got here and I told them everything and asked if I could call my roommate. Josh picked up the phone but was heavily slurring and I could tell that he was inside of a bar and could barely hear me. I just screamed please give Dylan the phone, hoping that Dylan was at least more sober than Josh was. So Josh put Dylan on the phone, and I don't know how, through my tears and sobs and through the screaming people and house music, but he heard me say that our apartment was robbed. He frantically said we are coming and hung up. They probably ran. While I was waiting for them, one of the policemen asked if he could try to take prints from my roommate's TV, and I agreed. He proceeds to then drop his flashlight directly on the screen, and as it shattered, he just looked at me. 
I'm like, really? So then Josh and Dylan get back and the policemen totally change their tone. They get aggressive and say that we were targeted for a reason. I'm pretty sure that since it was homecoming, the robbers were not expecting me to be there and were trying to just rob apartments blindly. We also lived on the ground floor so it's easier to get in those than in the two-story and three-story apartments. Josh is in the military. But Josh looks just like any other regular college freshman boy and his only friends at the time were literally me and Dylan so we were the only ones who knew he was in the military. They tried to accuse Josh of stashing guns and drugs everywhere and that's why we got robbed. I literally was like, are you freaking kidding me? They then tried to pull me to the side and say that Josh hired people to come rob his own apartment while I was inside. They asked me, how do you know these guys? I said, sir, I have known Josh since we were 13. We moved here together to attend university together. He just gave me a look. When they left we got our locks immediately changed and then I had to take the next day off of school to drive to the nearest Nissan dealership and then wait 7 hours for them to rewire a key fob for me. To the men who robbed me, let's not meet again, for your sake, because I'm older and angry and have defensive weapons now and won't be afraid to kick your ass. And to the cops who accused my roommate of robbing his own apartment, let's not meet again and I hope you got fired because, yes, I did report you both. I used to be employed as a child protection worker. A report came through about a stepfather who was being abusive to his children. I was given the investigation by my team leader. When I interviewed the oldest child with the police, she had very visible physical injuries and told me exactly what had happened. I'll spare the details, but it was horrific. As the children were in his sole care, we knew that they needed to be removed immediately. We sent a team of two workers out to the children's school while myself and a colleague called the stepfather into the office. I led the interview and it was horrible. He didn't even try to deny that he had hurt his stepchild, basically saying that's my kid, I'll do what I want and you can't stop me. When I served him with the paperwork he absolutely lost his mind. He was swearing and screaming and said, if we were outside this building right now I would end you. We ended up running out of the interview room, pressing our emergency alarm, and I even had to make a police report about the whole thing. It got really messy. The next day we had court for the children, and my manager decided I shouldn't attend due to everything that had happened the previous day. My colleague who attended told me that this man was at court and yelled several times something to the effect of where is that stupid worker who took my kids. I remember feeling a little freaked out, but it's not uncommon to hear things similar to this when you have to remove a child. It's understandable that emotions are very high. You build a bit of resilience working in this field, and overall I mainly felt relieved that those children had been placed with an aunt and were safe. About two weeks later, I had to stay back late at the office on an unrelated case. It was about 9 p.m. when I finished and I was the only person there. I walked out the back of the building to my car. It was really dark, but when I got close to the car, I thought I saw a shadow moving at the front of my car. Just for a second, and then it was gone. I was about 20 meters away at this point, but it startled me. I stood there for a second just looking at my car wondering if I was just being paranoid. While staring into the darkness, I started hearing tiny rustling noises, and whether I imagined them or not with all of the true crime horror stories I've ever heard flashed into my mind. Safe to say I freaked myself out and sprinted back to the building. I called my boyfriend to come and pick me up, explaining what had happened. By the time he drove up to the front doors, I had convinced myself I was being silly and asked him to drive me around to my car. He circled around, and with the headlights shining on my car, I could very clearly see that all four of my tires had been slashed. I was an absolute mess that night and called the police immediately. I was pretty sure that this man was responsible, but as I hadn't seen him, I couldn't say for sure. I took a few days off and came back to a meeting with my manager who had put together a safety plan for me and the other staff. 
She'd organized to have a security guard escort us to our cars and said very clearly that no one was to stay in the building after hours alone. Then about a week later, a letter was delivered to the office addressed to me. Any mail that comes into the office goes through our reception staff. Our lovely receptionist opened it and it was a note that said you're as good as dead. The words were typed and printed. She was an older woman and burst into tears when she read it. It didn't say who had sent it, but I am convinced it was this same man. Over the next few weeks letters kept coming, each one getting longer. They addressed me as the B-word and home wrecker, saying that I kidnapped and abused children. It was just horrible, horrible stuff. The threats in the letters were the worst. The person writing them threatened to assault, torture, kill, and find out where I live and to burn down the entire building. To be honest, the police were less than helpful. They basically said that given the nature of our work, they couldn't conclusively say it was this man, although they had questioned him. To me, it all seemed like a pretty massive coincidence. I'd never had anything like this happen before. They did say they were taking the letters very seriously and tracking down where they'd been posted from, but I never heard anything back about that. My workplace took the threats very seriously, too. All of the security was bumped up across the building and all staff completed refresher training on emergency management. One day on the way home from work I noticed that a car was following me. At first I thought I was being paranoid so I drove down a bunch of little streets, double backed onto the same route in a way that would make absolutely no sense. Even after all that a dark green Camry was still a little way behind me. I freaked out but had already planned in my head what I was going to do in this situation. I headed straight to the police station, planning to pull right up to the front of the building and beat my horn until I had someone's attention. The second I pulled into the police station the green Camry drove straight past and disappeared down a nearby side street. I sat there for a good 20 minutes too scared to get out of the car in case they came back around the corner. It dawned on me that in my panic I'd forgotten to get the license plate. That upsets me to this day. I told the police what I knew, but they told me that the man didn't have any car registered in his name. This was the final straw for me. I was a nervous wreck. I was looking around constantly at work and at home. I knew that he lived relatively close to me, so I even stopped going grocery shopping in case I ran into him. I stayed on stress leave for a month and heard from colleagues that the letters kept arriving. I was very honestly ready to quit, but then COVID happened. It really changed everything. Everyone went into lockdown and all access to the office was restricted. I started back working from home, driving a work car to and from appointments. I didn't go into the office regularly anymore, only allowed in small working groups when absolutely necessary. Over the next year, the letters slowed and eventually stopped. By the time we were allowed back in the office, there hadn't been any sign of this man for almost seven months. About a year later, I left child protection. I don't know what happened with those children, but my hope is that they are happy and safe with their family. And as for the man who I believe stalked and threatened me for doing my job, let's not meet ever, ever again. Hi everyone. I'm really writing this out as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I feel really stuck. Any advice is appreciated, but I'm not sure there's anything that can be said that will actually help. I've tried just about everything. I'm going to start from the beginning. This is a story two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone, and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house, because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So, we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. 
He suggested we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything and I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him I'm busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to end someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police, and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was on meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more. But things got even weirder. One day, I went out to my car to find a dead squirrel in my driveway. This squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in my driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in his front yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. Around Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote Here Lies the Last Son of a Gun Who Played Mind Games, November 2012. What the hell? All this time, still sending me texts. Eventually, I got fed up and I stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding completely, he threw a 50-pound flower pot at my front door. You know those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no-contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no-contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of COVID. I was trapped in my home, 24-7, with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me he was sorry for what he'd done. That he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. He then went on to tell me that he can tell my hair has gotten longer and I look beautiful. 
I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had. The timeline of everything that had ever happened. The texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage. The texts I sent him telling him the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate. The texts saying that he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is, he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose the protection order at all. So, in March 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird crap, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he got on drugs again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and as happy in our relationship as we can be. New Year's, 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and got footage of him sticking his head out his window and screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for about seven minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a long time. He called me a harlot multiple times. Said, happy freaking new year. He also said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police, who responded. They told me that he never said my name so they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over $1,000 on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't there. Going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace. Or, I'll put my penis on you. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is going to die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house screaming, Are you freaking proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everybody all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seems like he's off his medication again. And that was that, they left. Last night, I was awoken by hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. And that was that. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my backyard, and now that's gone. All of this is to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me. Where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work, because I have four cats and finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault I'm stuck in this situation. 
My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired and I'm angry. So I figured I'd write this to vent. I was stalked by a guest in my student accommodation. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late and last week I was just doing some laundry at around 11 p.m. I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I usually see him around a bit at night, but I didn't think much of it. I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in the dryer, and I hear the laundry room door beeping. It meant someone was coming in. There was the man, standing there with no clothes to wash just staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lifts. He followed me quickly and cornered me and asked for my Snapchat. I was tired and just wanted to get back to my room so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured if he'd message and try to flirt, I'd say I have a boyfriend, sorry if you thought this was anything else and that would be the end of it. Anyway, he starts messaging me. It's kind of normal then he starts saying weird stuff like I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here. And I've been watching you. I noticed that you come out mostly at night. He told me that he is only visiting for five more days. Then it gets worse. He says, I love you, I can't help it. And then I respond with, I have a boyfriend. He says, I only want you and continues to completely ignore that. He asked to come to my room and I said no, then he wanted a hug. He asked me if I lived alone and if I was a virgin. He kept saying he loved me and that I was perfect for him and that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat, spoke to him a little bit more to gather evidence so that I could take it to the receptionist in the morning. He's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend who lives on the second floor to walk me down to the laundry room. We sat in the student lounge area and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I'd already picked it up. I run back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room, but I said it's okay I'll just lock my door. It's about 1 a.m. and I hear someone outside my room trying to get in. I text my friend if he's outside my room and he replied with no so I just froze. I didn't want to make a sound. I felt sick to my stomach and helpless. Eventually it stopped and whoever it was went away. In the morning I reported this to reception and then went to stay a few days with my boyfriend. Then, I went to London to visit a friend and last night was the first time I'd spent a night in my room since this happened. I'm very paranoid now, sadly I should probably be used to this. It's not the first time I've been sexually harassed, one guy tried to kiss me in a club by grabbing my head and a bunch of other things have happened that I won't go into here. But anyway, I'm terrified to go outside my room after dark, I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid.